he spent his adult life working in America, Oliver Herford was born in Sheffield in the north of England in 1860. In 1876, when he was 16 years old, he left England for America and his family relocated to Chicago. Having shown a pronounced talent for both visual art and creative writing, Herford travelled back to England at the age of 19 to attend the Slade School of Art in London and he followed this with more study at the Académie Julian in Paris. With his studies completed he headed back to America and set himself up in New York where all the major book and magazine publishers had their offices. And it was from there that he established and developed his reputation as an illustrator and writer of witty prose and verse. The humour magazine Life was first published in 1883 and within a couple of years Herford was among those contributing pen and ink illustrations. And although he was never what you would call a frequent contributor, his illustrations continued to appear in its pages and on its covers for the next three decades. His early work had to be translated through engraving for reproduction, but when photolithography became more widely used, he developed a lighter, more spontaneous technique. In 1894, he published his illustrated book of verse, Artful Antics, which featured a large volume of amusing pen and ink spot illustrations. And this was followed a year later by a series of particularly accomplished full-page monochromes for Joel Chandler Harris's book, Mr. Rabbit at Home and the success of this book greatly increased his visibility and popularity. In 1898 he both wrote and illustrated The Bashful Earthquake, a collection of absurd frivolous verse accompanied by equally whimsical line illustrations. His Alphabet of Celebrities was published in 1899 and this book marked a change in his stylistic approach with a series of much blockier woodcut style pen drawings and he persisted with this more graphic approach for 1900's A Child's Primer of Natural History, which featured simple but descriptive monochromes of amusing animals alongside his comic verses on the facing pages. In 1904 he branched out stylistically again with the Rubaiyat of a Persian kitten, with illustrations which were created with wax crayon directly onto lithographic stone. The use of this technique created a whole new stylistic persona in his work and he returned to it soon after for the kitten's garden of verses. Herford's success as both a writer and illustrator of books continued throughout the early decades of the 20th century with any number of projects including a 1917 line only edition of Alice in Wonderland and as time went on he increasingly appeared in several popular magazines including the Ladies Home Journal. Frequently these images were published in full colour and in their creation he didn't rely on an ink line but instead used carefully applied tonal application to create the illusion of depth and substance. For the rest of his career Herford continued to enjoy popular and critical success and as well as several more illustrated books his amusing full colour sequential series about the misadventures of the couple Jill and Toby ran in the Mentor magazine for several years into the 1930s but its run came to an end when after a lifetime of productive creativity Oliver Herford died at the age of 75 in 1935. Charles Jonty was a French illustrator and artist who worked successfully in paint, pen and ink, wood engraving and etching, but very few now know his name even in France. He was born in 1876 in the town of Jargo near Orléans. In his late teens he studied art briefly with the painter Fernand Corman, but subsequently enlisted as a soldier in the French army in 1896. After his spell in the army he returned to civilian life and seemingly without too much effort he quickly landed several major clients from magazine publishing in Paris. Among them were Luria and La Bayonet, both of which kept him in regular work. And in 1902, the book Bonhomme de Paris by André Bonnier was published, featuring illustrations by Gentil, and this gave his growing reputation an additional boost. But at this point it was work for magazines which dominated his output. When war came in 1914, he fought at the front against the Germans, and the atrocities he witnessed led to an understandable lifelong hatred of all things Germanic, 
Despite being a combatant, he also found time to create some rather cheerful takes on military life during wartime, which were published in La Bayonette. Once the war had ended, Gentil carried on with his magazine work, but he also began producing illustrations for novels, many of which were editions of the classic works of Honoré de Balzac. For these books he chose to create many of his images, although not all of them, as etchings and some were printed in colour but most were monochrome. There were full page illustrations and spot illustrations dotted throughout these volumes and Jaunty was particularly adept at creating plausible environments and atmospheres using his loose but expressive linear technique. His magazine illustrations were usually reproduced as full colour from his pen and watercolour wash originals which generally utilised restrained naturalistic colour palettes. Despite their cartoon styling, the observational attention he paid to the detail in the setting of most of his work was nothing short of meticulous, and these images endure as accurate and absorbing evocations of French urban and rural life throughout the 1920s and 30s. But however accurate they were, he was one of the earliest to employ the deceptively casual technique which evolved into what became known in continental Europe as the Clear Line School. Given Jaunty's enduring hostility towards Germany, it seems strange that he seems to have left the subject alone in the work he produced during the Second World War, and it was book illustration which by now had come to dominate his output. In 1944, his edition of Georges Sand's La Mer au Diable was published, with 24 absorbing and atmospheric engravings in both colour and monochrome. The last published work in his lifetime was an edition of Balzac's La Vieille Fille in 1951 and Charles Gentil died in Paris in 1956 at the age of 79. British poster artist Frank Newbold was born in Bradford, West Yorkshire in 1887 and he studied graphics at Bradford School of Art between 1905 and 1908. He worked for a couple of years in the art department of a local publishers, which gave him invaluable experience of the possibilities and limitations of the print process. In 1911 he moved to London to continue his art studies at Camberwell School of Art, but when the Great War started in 1914 he joined the army and fought in France. He managed to return unscathed to civilian life when it was all over, and in 1919 he set up a studio in London from where he mainly produced monochrome magazine illustrations. But in 1921 he began to create colour posters for London Transport, and this body of work set the stylistic tone and nature of his future output. He had been impressed by the graphic power of posterization found in the work of earlier modernists such as the Begastaffs, Lucien Bernhard and Ludwig Holwein and with his own background working directly with print he had a natural affinity for creating similarly impossible to ignore images. In addition to the many commissions he was given by the transport company, in 1924 he also designed a series of even more compelling posters for the Empire Marketing Board. This prestigious commission involved him travelling to a number of exotic far-flung locations to produce sketches and studies which would inform the eventual series of posters. Two years later he also began producing posters for the London and North Eastern Railway which advertised the various destinations the company travelled to. Newball was one of five illustrators who were each given a contract to create five posters a year for a fee of £500 which translates as a non too generous £30,000 or $40,000 at the time of writing. But again his expenses were paid to travel and stay at the admitted less exotic locations than those of the Empire Commission. Virtually all his images continued to make use of varying degrees of non-naturalistic posterized colour which frequently bordered on the positively psychedelic. Most of these were, as you would expect, images of figures interacting with the usually dramatically composed landscape, but on occasion he branched out into more playful, humorous images, such as his East Coast Frolics series. During World War II, Newball worked for the War Office, creating propaganda material. 
including a series of posters which were romantic evocations of British landscapes designed to fill the civilian population with patriotic pride. After the war he continued to work as a poster artist for rail companies and other clients, but unfortunately Newbold's wife died in 1947 and four years later in 1951 he too left early at the age of only 64. Biographical information about children's illustrator Dorothy M. Wheeler is in particularly short supply, but fortunately there are plenty of examples of her work. She was born in an unspecified location in South East England in 1891, and there's no record of her family circumstances. She went on to study at Blackheath School of Art, and she would most likely have completed her studies around 1915 in which case she obviously found commissions soon after leaving art school because her illustrated edition of the Book of English Nursery Rhymes written by Lavinia Edna Walter was first published in 1916. And this book featured Wheeler's delicate, charming watercolours as full-page illustrations set within detailed linear borders to accompany the rhymes as actual sheet music to be played and sung. Four years later, a series of her charming fairy-themed watercolours was published as a set of postcards, which also proved to be very popular with the British public. More books of fairy and woodland fantasy followed in the next two decades, all of which featured her finely controlled calligraphic line work and bright washes of tonal watercolour. In 1939, she was chosen to illustrate her first Enid Blyton book, The Enchanted Wood, and later in the same year she illustrated another, The Little Tree House. For younger viewers and those in other countries who are probably unaware of Blyton, she was easily the most popular British children's author of the 20th century, so this association greatly enhanced Wheeler's reputation. Although the work she created for the Blyton books generally continued to use the same method as her earlier output, the line work became bolder and the application of colour more simplistic than previously. Whether this was her decision or that of the publishers I don't know, but it did serve to make her style more contemporary, even if not as sensitive. For the next quarter of a century Wheeler continued to illustrate an astonishing volume of Blyton stories. Quite a few of these were series of books about particular characters and they appeared in a number of different formats using full and spot colour as well as monochrome line. And the immense success of the books inevitably led to other printed material including playing cards and calendars based on the characters from the various stories she illustrated. And it seems the only time in her later career that Wheeler created anything that wasn't connected to Blyton was when she wrote and illustrated her own version of The Three Little Pigs in 1951. But she was still illustrating Blyton books up to the year she died in 1966 at the age of 75. And that's the end of another instalment and I hope our paths converge again when the next one's uploaded.